Imagine a horizontally scalable database that puts data everywhere your users are. It seems intuitive, but most databases are still light years away from true turnkey global distribution. Azure Cosmos DB offers the first globally distributed multi-model database service for building planet scale apps. It's been powering Microsoft's internet scale services for years, and now it's ready to launch yours. Only Azure Cosmos DB makes global distribution turnkey. You can add Azure locations to your database anywhere across the world at any time with a single click. Azure Cosmos DB will seamlessly replicate your data and make it highly available. Azure Cosmos DB allows you to scale throughput and storage elastically and globally. You only pay for the throughput and storage you need anywhere in the world at any time. As the first and only schema agnostic database, Azure Cosmos DB automatically indexes all your data so you can perform blazing fast queries. And since no data is born relational, the multi-model and multi-API capabilities remove the friction, allowing you to build with any data model and API. While most database services force you to choose between strong or eventual consistency, Azure Cosmos DB provides multiple, well-defined, intuitive consistency choices, so you can select just the right one for your app. Take off with confidence knowing Azure Cosmos DB provides guarantees and comprehensive SLAs other databases would never attempt. High availability, consistency, throughput, and single-digit millisecond latencies at the 99th percentile. Your app deserves a globally distributed database service that's out of this world. Welcome to Azure Cosmos DB. Hey everybody, Jay, welcome back to Azure One Bytes. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, it's been another week uh, of, of things to learn. And what do we do here? Well, we learn about the people, the products, the process, and all the things that go into an amazing Azure experience. So uh, I've got some new features this week. I got a nice slick background music. Uh, love StreamYard, great product, helps you do some really cool things. Uh, this week, I've got some really great guests that are going to join me to talk about Cosmos DB, which we just watched a little video on. Um, it is a globally distributed database service within Azure that allows you to create no SQL databases, access them extremely fast, low latency, uh, high throughput, consistency, you name it. There are all these different models. Our, my guests today are going to tell me all about it. And so... Uh, I'm going to bring them both in one at a time. Uh, first, I'm going to bring in uh, Gal Levy. Hi, Gal. How are you? Hey, everyone. It's great to be here. That intro was amazing. I, I love it. Thank you. <laughs> and also, uh, I'm going to bring in Theo Van Cray. Hey, Theo. Hello. How are you? Hello. I'm good. How are you, Jay? I'm great. Uh, so where are the two of you uh, located? Where are you, you broadcasting from today? I'm in New York City. Oh, me too. I'm in Brooklyn. And Same. I'm, also I'm, Brooklyn. In a, I'm in a tiny little town called Westham in the northwest of England, so <laughs> the UK. Well, we are, you know, uh, multi-continental today, but New York seems to have the uh, the uh, the big lead on who where and where we're from. So uh, we've got a really cool episode that uh, we, we're going to talk about today. We're going to spend a lot of time on. Azure Cosmos DB, we don't have a lot of time, but the time we have, we're going to spend on doing that. And, and before I, uh, we get too much into things, I want to remind everybody of a few things. One, um, we've always got a poll, and we'd love you to take this poll. I think it'll help set some context for my guests about who's watching and, and what they're watching for. And uh, this week, we've got, are you currently using NoSQL? for your applications. I'd love to know a little bit more. You can vote yes, no, or it's complicated. It's one of my favorite answers. And then we've got uh, the docs for today's show. So all the documentation that you would want to point to, the learn module, uh, which I absolutely recommend you go and check out. Uh, you can uh, get this free education right within Microsoft Learn. It's gamified, so you can have points. As you can see, I am an 8900 XP wizard 
uh, on doing things with Learn and Cosmos DB. So that that is the the big uh, the, the big intro, guys. Uh, next, we're going to kind of get into you for uh, a minute, and so I want to remind everybody if you've got questions and comments you can send them in the chat whichever chat you're using and that includes the native chat within uh learn tv so aka.ms slash learn tv or if you're watching on youtube or twitch you can send them that way um so i want to ask you both a little bit about your background where you how you got here and so i always ask that question and i'm going to ask uh theo First, if you just tell me a little bit about your background and how you got here. Yeah, so um, I don't know how far to go back. I'll just go back <laughs> to when I started in, in tech, I guess. Uh, I started as a, a software engineer working uh, for a big insurance company. Um, uh, I don't know why I'm um, not saying who they are. It's AXA. <laughs> I, I, I worked for AXA for quite a long time. And then I worked in the government in the UK uh, as well, um, moved into a role as an architect. And then uh, I came to uh, Microsoft. Um, in between those roles, I, I did a, a master's degree in data science. So I was getting into um, uh, distributed uh, data platforms, NoSQL and big data. And I, I kind of developed an interest in those areas. Uh, and then I, I worked in the, in the customer success unit as a cloud solution architect for a couple of years before joining the Cosmos DB team. Uh, although really I was uh, straight on to Cosmos DB from day one. Um, I think it was. I think it was just being released at that time, so there was um, a lot of buzz around it. There still is a lot of buzz around it, uh, and so yeah, I. Um, it feels like I've always been working on it, but really, it's only been sort of uh, two, three, four years uh, now. So yeah, that's that's me in a nutshell. And watching the the product kind of grow has been very, very uh, impressive. Yeah. Uh, so, Gal, I've got the same question for you. Um, how did you get here? Sure. Also, in my mind, I'm thinking, how far do I want to you know, go back? But in terms of career-wise, I started off my career in software engineering at Datastax, actually, working at Cassandra. And eventually, I transitioned over to PM. And now I'm a PM at Microsoft, still working on database software, just working on the API for MongoDB. In between, I did an MBA at uh, UC Berkeley. Cool. Cool. That's that's. Great to learn a little bit both about your background. I think it's always helpful for everyone to kind of get some context set about our subject. And so speaking of getting some context set around our subject, um, I, I'd love to learn a little bit more. Uh, I, I, I'm lucky enough, I know uh, some stuff about Cosmos TV, but both of you are working as uh, people in the product team getting uh, things out there about how uh, to improve, use all these things, your applications uh, with Cosmos DB. And so I'd love if one of you wanted to like give me a, a brief intro and some information that you feel like you want to set context with. How about uh, you, you start with us, uh, Gal? Sure. Um, do we mean like context on Cosmos DB or on the, yeah. the product uh, in general, Cosmos DB? Yeah, Cosmos. Yeah, so, uh, Cosmos DB is a globally replicated uh, database platform that's multi-model, meaning there are different APIs that can be used to access it. And what's great about that is as a developer, I don't have to learn a new database format basically in order to use Cosmos DB. I can use a database I'm uh, format I'm most familiar with. So for example, MongoDB or Cassandra, I can use the API in the same applications as I was using before and not really have to change um, much of anything in order to leverage the benefits of Cosmos DB. Obviously, we also offer the SQL API, which is the native API uh, for Cosmos DB, but that's not the only option. Gotcha, gotcha. And so you're using uh, these different APIs uh, like you would say through any of the other uh, native. So if I'm, I'm using the SDK that uh, MongoDB releases in order to actually connect an application to it, um, you, you don't have to make that modification. It's more like a, um, a connection string change, if I'm right. Exactly. And from the client's perspective, you're still using a MongoDB database, but you're actually using Cosmos DB and leveraging all the benefits of that. Sure. So you said that you've focused on the MongoDB portion of things. And I, I, I got a question for you about that. And uh, Theo, you'll be able to give me a little bit on this as well. 
so if I'm building a new app, uh, should I choose the Cassandra or Mongo API or the SQL API? What, what do you believe is is the right move? And uh, Theo, I'll ask you to jump in as well after uh, we hear from Gaul. Oh, really? I, I'm I'm biased with the obviously working on MongoDB, but from from my perspective, um, if you're a MongoDB developer and you've gained those skills of using you know the MongoDB uh, drivers and the tools and all that, you probably want to keep using that knowledge you've gained over time and not have to totally you know change your way of your way of thinking basically and not have to change your apps. So if I was a MongoDB developer, I would use the MongoDB API on Cosmos DB because I still get the benefits of Cosmos DB, but I don't have to uh, you know learn a new query language. I can keep my apps the same as they were before and just use a new database uh, platform on top of that. Gotcha. And uh, Theo, you know, same question. If you were building an app, why would I select Cassandra as opposed to one of those other APIs? Yes, yeah, it's, it's a really great question. It's one of those questions that kind of demands that you, you start with that horrible, it depends uh, response. It depends where you're coming from. Uh, I mean, if you're if you're at one end of a spectrum where you're where you're really wanting to solve for a performance, let's say, and efficiency, it would be difficult to look past the core API, the SQL API, because that's the the you know that's really the cloud native uh, platform. That's where it started. All all of our platform level features usually ship there first. Um, so in terms of pure cold performance, uh, uh, and that's where you were going. Uh, you, you'd have to uh, recommend that. But then again, that's not to say that the other APIs aren't kind of close to matching it. And there are other mm -hmm. things that come into this as well. Like like Gal just said, if you're coming from a, a different developer space, you know, it's not just about the platform. It's also about the programmability uh, and developer experience as well. Uh, and of course, Mongo and Cassandra, much as we'd love to, to embrace, uh, you know, the SQL uh, proprietary standard, uh, they are open standards. And that and that tends to be uh, important to a lot of companies who are, you know, uh, having uh, multi-cloud strategies and, uh, and so on and so forth. So it's a complex it's a complex thing to answer. It's not something you can really uh, recommend to somebody. It really depends on where your starting point is. So, yeah, I, I, um, I like Gal's answer. If you're coming from a place where you really like the, the Mongo experience or the Cassandra experience, choose those. Uh, if you're really pure greenfield and starting from scratch, and, and especially if you want to really solve for a particular um, uh, performance um, characteristics, then yeah, you may want to take a look at the core API. Gotcha. Thank you so much, both of you, for the, those answers. I, I really do appreciate getting a, that little bit more context set. Uh, so one of the things I, I'd love to learn a little bit more about um, is are, are some common use cases, if you'd like to talk about it just for a second. Gal, if you'd like to just give me some, say, common use cases for the MongoDB API. Yeah. Um, so I guess common use cases for the MongoDB API are ones that leverage Cosmos DB's benefits. So the ability to use you know MongoDB and pretend as if Cosmos DB is a MongoDB database, but mm -hmm. also scaling is a major factor. So the MongoDB API on Cosmos DB um, is able to scale instantaneously within l less than a second. And uh, that's a little benefit because sometimes people have applications that don't actually use all the scale at once. They kind of go up and down depending on the, the time of day. And you don't want to delay when you need that scale. You want it immediately. And that's a major, major use case for us. Gotcha. Theo, uh, same question relating to the, the Cassandra API. Um, yeah. yeah. I guess where Cassandra differs, the main area where it differs is it has a schema. It's the only uh, API that does. So if you're particularly attached to having a schema and there's lots of reasons that you might want to uh, uh, have the schema at that layer, then then you would use Cassandra. Um, also, similarly, a performance, uh, you know, order catalog type scenarios or even IoT type scenarios, scenarios where really throughput and, and uh, is, uh, is important, latency is important, availability is important. Actually, all of the APIs are, are sort of common in that respect. Where the where the differences are, and is it like we said before, the the developer experience. Um, but where where we generally see use cases across the whole of Cosmos DB is the things we already talked about. The kind of uh, where you need um, uh, great performance, uh, IoT type scenarios, retail scenarios. Um, uh, ordering, uh, you know, comparison website scenarios. I, I would actually say that between all of the APIs, you have a pretty general purpose set of 
um, functionality there. So there's, there isn't really a use case that I could say you couldn't use a, a Cosmos DB for that, or there wouldn't be a way of really optimizing it. Um, uh, but it is a distributed database, and so you know if if you were coming from the relational world, then uh, there there'd be some learning to do at the very least. Even though I would confidently say that you could uh, you know apply your use case uh, very well to it. And sure. So one of the things that you said is distributed. So that really uh, lends to, say, very globally diverse types of applications that may be having different endpoints uh, or or I should say user bases in different parts of the world. Um, so having, you know, edge locations that are distributed uh, that you can replicate your data to, I'd imagine, is, is kind of crucial in being able to really get a lot of the benefits. And I know that there's... Um, multi-master reads uh, and writes so that if you're in a different uh, than like whatever you've you've initially created a different region, uh, you can write to yep. multiple regions and then you can pick your consistency level. So, you know, eventual consistency session, things like that, they all become available. So, uh, Gal and uh, Dio, I know you both have a little bit of presentations to show me. We've got about, well, 45 minutes or so, maybe a little less to start going into them. And God, I'd love you to kind of jump into what you, you, you've pre uh, prepared for today. Sure. Uh, if it's possible, can we please uh, share the slides I have? There yeah. So I, I kind of wanted to drill in a bit on the, on the scale because this really applies to all of Cosmos DB. So we said, you know, uh, Jay, you mentioned we have, you know, regions all over the world and you're able to scale up and down based on, on user demand in those regions, as well as have very high availability. We, we offer up to five nines of availability uh, because of the multi-primary rights uh, feature. And when I say like scaling, I don't just mean scaling. Um, so not, not just scaling VMs. Since we don't have a concept of VMs, we essentially uh, sell throughput of the database. And the reason for that is because we're a multi-tenant system, meaning that we have a huge huge pool of resources that we can allocate resources and throughput to you at any second very very fast to you as you need it and you only pay for what you need so that allows you as a user to scale in fractions of vm of granularity meaning that you're only paying for what you use and you can get all the scale you need whenever you need it which and also means right, you don't have to pay if we, we don't when you actually don't need it so that, and if i'm awesome. right that the pricing module is based on request units, which are basically IO utilization and throughput that you, you're, you're actually making use of. And I know there's like two different models. There's a, a reserved yeah. unit and a serverless unit. And I'll give you some time to go through that. Yeah, so um, on that note, imagine you have a, a um a use case similar to the one in the middle here where you're kind of your workload is spiking up depending on the time if you're using vms you would have to wait you know to achieve cost you know effectiveness here you'd have to wait imagine blocks of time as you scale up your vms up and up and up in blocks and then down and down and down with cosmos db you don't have to wait for those vms to scale up and don't have to over provision you just pay for what you use and you scale mm -hmm. up exactly you follow that line much much closer than you would with vms and that saves you money one, and most importantly, it gets your users the performance they expect. Your database does not slow down. You always get 100% performance for your database because of this, because we have giant pools of resources we can allocate to you immediately. Um, what you mentioned with reserved instances is very applicable to standard provision throughput. Uh, the, the slide you see here is the three different ways we have of provisioning resources in Cosmos DB. With standard provision throughput, that's where you kind of set the limits of how much are you, how much request unit budget you need for your database. And this is very good for workloads that are very consistent. So if you know you always need around 7,000 RUs, you can have that 7,000 RUs, uh, you know, pre-provisioned uh, as, uh, as um, uh, you know, resources and know that you can save money with that because you don't really need to change that that often. However, if you have a spiky workload, auto scale is a great choice because you only pay for the resources you provision and you'll scale up and down instantaneously depending on what you need. And the last one here is serverless, which is GA now on the API for MongoDB, where if your database is idle, you pay nothing, you pay zero for that. And you only pay for the RUs you actually use. And that's really good for sporadic workloads 
or dev and test or workloads where you only you know you use a database like once a week or some something like that. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, very very cool. Like those the, being able to pick a pricing model around these different things is really important. I think for our users because um, you have to be budget conscious when you're working with a, a globally distributed database. Uh, I'd imagine uh, rather than just you know well you know spinning things up and and not worrying about what things cost it, it that's not that's that's not something that people are are, are really interested in doing and and one of the things that I I've really enjoyed about Cosmos DB is how it's really empowered the developer because there's way less management of the underlying systems that you would have in traditional database. Uh, administration work. And so now you can have DBAs within your team kind of re, uh, readjust uh, their workflow. So maybe that they're more focused on making sure that the indexes are right and ensuring consistency levels are right and working with the SDKs to uh, work with backups and restorations and things like that. All, all that I would imagine really helps give the developer a, a bigger hand in the situation. Exactly. And, and one great case of that here is you can even switch between throughput models on your same Mongo, you know, Mongo API collections between standard and auto scale, you can change. And that's why we always recommend for users to start off with auto scale first, see where their workload patterns go, and then switch to standard if they feel like that will save them money. So it's up to the developer to choose which one they prefer. Um, one great case of where a lot of this operational workload is lifted is um, essentially, you know, with sharding. So sharding is very important because it allows you to horizontally scale your database. And in Cosmos DB, sharding or partitioning is native. It's a cloud native database and it's built to horizontally scale as much as you want. And unlike in the MongoDB case, unlike many other MongoDB services, um, Cosmos DB manages the sharding automatically for you. As long as you choose a, a shard key or partition key, that evenly splits the data, which is something that you know um, uh, these people you were speaking about, like uh, DevOps folks, can really focus on on that instead of the actual sharding aspect. As long as you choose the right partition key, the sharding key, Cosmos DB will automatically shard for you and scale up and down to your needs, and not just scale a little bit up and down, scale unlimited, like as much as you want. There, there's there's no limit there, which is really amazing because. It manages all this for you. You don't have to decide how many shards you want and you don't have to pay for the metadata service to manage that. It's all done automatically for you by Cosmos DB. And that's one of the benefits of building your MongoDB apps on the API for MongoDB on Cosmos DB. Very, very cool. And um, one of the questions I, I have is, uh, how long does it actually take to auto scale or to scale up that database that I might be using? Yeah. So. Um, since we have a giant pool of resources that allocate things to you instantaneously, your scaling is instantaneous. There's no wait time. Your users don't have to wait and you only pay for what you're actually using at that point in time. So it's, it's really the best of both worlds there. And that's, gotcha. with, the, and that's with the auto scale model that I, I mentioned right here, the, the middle one. And one more question is why is the API for more MongoDB just more efficient than say other MongoDB offerings? So yeah, so first off, it's more efficient first because you, the that entire operational kind of workload of having to manage sharding and the deployment and, and upgrades and all that is taken away from you. Sharding is done automatically for you. Upgrades take seconds because we don't run any MongoDB Inc. code. We act as if we're a MongoDB database and implement the wire protocol for MongoDB, but all of our versions are in one code base and uh, to upgrade between versions, it's just feature flags on or off and it takes seconds to do. So that's that's one aspect of efficiency. The the second aspect is that we have that giant pool of resources that we can allocate to you effectively whenever you need it immediately. Meaning that you're only paying for the resources you use instead of over provisioning VMs and waiting for your usage to catch up and then over provisioning again to make sure that you, you don't get a degradation in performance. So rather than say going with another offering from another company that, that is basically leveraging uh, virtual machines or containers on the platform. So, you know, GCP, AWS, or, or even Azure, rather than letting a, a, a third party in. And I know MongoDB, they have their own service, it works great, but it's, it's still 
running on top of somebody else's cloud as opposed to this, which is, is native to Azure. Exactly. Imagine you have a request, doesn't matter what, what kind of request it is. In Cosmos DB API for MongoDB, um, as your load goes up in a VM-based kind of uh, framework, as your load in the, v in the VMs goes up, your requests get slower and slower and slower until they eventually uh, can't go through anymore. In Cosmos DB, the idea is you want to have 100% guaranteed um, expected performance for each request, and you'll get that. And when you need more throughput, you can pay for more throughput. You can auto scale to that throughput immediately. So your requests always behave in the same expected way. And there's no surprise when suddenly a bunch of users start using your platform, uh, your app, and then your performance for your database just goes way down because you weren't prepared. Gotcha. So one more question for you. And then I'd love to hear a little bit more about Cassandra, unless you've got more to show us. Uh, I, 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 I'm curious, you mentioned about all those different features and upgrades that you, you, you've you got there. And, and I was just curious, how do I upgrade my database account? Because I know Cosmos DB kind of has this hierarchy of like uh, account than the actual container that you're you're working with. Yeah, so upgrades, actually I'll go back to this slide because I like this slide because it has a cat and I have a cat. So I, I like talking about cats in general. I have a cat. And if my cat needed to upgrade my database, my cat would be able to, to do it because it's literally one button press in the portal or programmatically it can be done. And there is no, uh, you know, the database stays online. Everything keeps working just as you expect. You just get to leverage those new features immediately. And you just to demonstrate this, you just go in the portal, click this button, set the version to whichever version you want. And then your database starts working that way with uh, every new connection. And to top that off, with those feature flags, you can even undo the changes if you decided to do that. You can go back and downgrade to a different version. And because of the way our code base is structured, we're not limited to you know end of lifeing older versions. We just have all of our versions in the same code base, so we can just keep them running for as long as we want. And you can upgrade and downgrade between the versions you want to get the features your app desires, basically. Well, I am a dog person, and my dog is very, very excited to be here. <laughs> um in, in my apartment and home but so uh, thank you very much and so i'm curious Kyle, is there anything else you'd like to show me um before we head over to theo so he can show us a little bit more about the cassandra would this be uh, a good time to, to demonstrate just one quick thing with um with robo 3t yeah sure Sure. Let me just uh, share a different screen here. Just give me one moment, please. Sure. And to remind everybody, if you've got questions or comments, use the chat, ask them now. And if you haven't already, take the poll, please. Uh, go to aka.ms slash learn TV to do that. All right, Kyle, I'm going to bring up your screen. And you've got Robo3T, which I know is a, um, a, a tool to actually browse within databases. Exactly, yeah. And I just wanted to demonstrate. Um, this is a Cosmos DB Mongo uh, API for MongoDB database uh, and collection here. You can see the collections they have. And I want to demonstrate how uh, these collections work in the same way you expect, as if it's a MongoDB database, but it's not. It's a Cosmos DB database uh, with API for MongoDB running on top of it. But all the tools and all the, the SDKs work as you expect. And that's really, really important because as a developer, I don't want my app to have to change. I want it to stay as similar as possible and just leverage all the benefits we just mentioned of Cosmos DB. So you can see, I can go into this demo collection and just double click on it and see some documents. Everything works as expected. I can insert documents. Let me just insert a document here. In this case, this uh, collection is sharded on user ID. I can validate and I can and I can insert it and everything works as expected. And this is the same experience we want everyone to find with their tooling because we want the experience to be the same for developers, but at the mm -hmm. same time being able to leverage uh, the benefits of Cosmos DB um, as well. Very cool. Yeah. And then we have our, our, our keys and our values and everything that we would expect uh, yeah. along with that incremented ID that if you uh, don't necessarily specify your own ID, you can just have uh, Cosmos, like create your incremented ID. And then uh, you just, when you're creating this, you're, you're indexing on one of these fields and, and, and having, uh, Cosmos, uh, or I should say you're, you're having a shard, a shard key set on one of these, and then you're letting auto indexing kind of happen. And you don't have to worry about 
managing data distribution. You just pick where you want it to go and let Cosmos move your data across. And you can see we're indexed here on, uh, we have indexes for ID and a wildcard index as well. So very, very cool. So uh, unless you've got anything else to show me, I'd love to hear a little bit from Theo and see what uh, I can learn about that Cassandra. That's all I uh, offer. Thank you. No problem, Gal. Thank you so much. So, Theo, uh, thank you for giving me some time. Um, I, I've got some questions uh, about the Cassandra API. And uh, the first thing is I know that there's Cassandra managed instances that exist on Azure, but I'm, I'm curious, is that part of Cosmos DB or is the Cassandra API a separate offering? Um, yeah, so the the answer to that is yes and no. <laughs> it, it is part of uh, Cosmos DB in the sense that it was uh, built by the uh, Cosmos DB team, and it also reuses the Cosmos DB control plane uh, for all of the automation that we do. But it's actually a separate product. It runs open source Apache Cassandra, uh, and we automate deployment and scaling and maintenance uh, uh, on that. Uh, so it's a, se it's a separate offering. So is it kind of like the the same relationship that say um, SQL Server for Azure or Azure SQL has to say an SQL managed instance? Exactly. Is that kind of like a one to one there? Yeah, you got it. It's the same same idea. Yeah. Great, great. So I know Theo, you've you've got some stuff to kind of uh, present for us, and I'd I'd love to take a look if uh, you mind me bringing your screen up. Sure. Yeah. Let me know when you can see it because um, I can't okay. see. Okay. Cassandra, the cool bits. Yeah, so I wanted to talk a little bit, just a little intro, I guess, to Cassandra. Um, uh, you know, what's good about it, what's not good about it. Uh, what's good about it is pretty simple. It's it, it's performance, right? It's distributed, linear scale, uh, right optimized, fast reads. It's very resilient, fault tolerant. It's actually pretty easy to uh, use as well. Uh, the, the learning curve, at least for the, from the developer side, I should say, is easy. What's not so easy is is maintaining it, right? <laughs> so uh, the back end and uh, replication settings and different configurations uh, and just running the platform in general can be difficult, which of course makes it a great candidate for being an API on Cosmos DB. Uh, Cosmos DB at the back end is pretty similar uh, architecture, so it makes it re relatively, uh, I don't want to say too straightforward, I don't want to make it seem like it's too easy, uh, but we can surface this API and uh, much as uh, Agal was showing there, all of the uh, SDKs and uh, and things that you would expect uh, will work. That does depend on feature supportability. So we, we don't support 100% of everything uh, that you would expect. So we definitely recommend reviewing our docs to see um, what things we support and what things we don't support. Um, but we're bringing new features all the time. And, and usually by features, what I mean is things that are, are already expected in Cassandra, but we're adding them uh, to this API um, so that you know it, it can be completely feature uh, complete. So things like materialized views in private preview there, lightweight transactions is now in public preview, uh, truncate named indexes, uh, clustering key indexes uh, are now in private preview as well. And then uh, we have the type of features that we call kind of unique to Cassandra API. So change feed is something that's unique to Cosmos DB. Uh, and it's a programmability model for being able to do event sourcing uh, uh, um, type applications. And feed ranges uh, is, a, is a way of doing that um, with uh, a processing in parallel for very large types of workloads. Uh, and we've also got server-side retries now in GA as well. And there's some features we're working on right now. So uh, um, we're working on native RBAC, which is the role command in Cassandra. Again, it's something that you expect at Cassandra, but we're adding uh, feature compatibility all the time. Uh, and then there's things that are, again, unique to Cassandra API. Point in time restore is a, is a feature that's in the platform uh, that we're servicing in the API. Uh, and we're working on a, a public uh, Azure search, um, Azure cognitive search integration as well. And then there's Cassandra Managed Instance, which uh, I'll, I'll probably talk about a little bit more later uh, as well. Uh, we're adding some new features there, and there's some stuff coming also. Uh, but what I wanted to hit on uh, was um, a question that we're, as you can imagine, we're obviously getting quite a lot since Managed Instance went GA last November. Uh, mm -hmm. How do you choose, or what, what would we recommend? Um, and the answer to that is really... Um, 
it really depends <laughs> where you're coming from. It's a bit like the, the answer to the other question, uh, which API uh, should you choose? But specifically here, when you're choosing between uh, two offerings that look very much the same or similar, it's really a spectrum between control versus productivity. So it's very much like the, the um, I guess, the choice between running IaaS implementations and applications versus uh, uh, using PaaS uh, services generally. Uh, of course, if you're rolling your own stuff, you've got a lot more control, but you've got less productivity and vice versa. When you have a lot of productivity that you might not be able to do certain things that you expect or you need fine grain control. And what this kind of boils down to, the, the analogy that um, I think Scott Hanselman first used and I've stole it ever since, uh, is this kind of, kind of think of it like an Uber uh, or a manual or an auto shift. If, you're, uh, if you need a car to go somewhere, um, and you can't get a bus or you can't get a train, you need a car for whatever reason, uh, but you don't have a driving license or, or you don't have a car or you can't afford one, then obviously Uber is going to look great to you. Uh, but if you have a car and you have a driving license, then obviously you, you, you're choosing between a manual shift and an auto shift. And that, that analogy kind of works for me because there is this kind of line between these types of offerings or, or self-hosting, I should say, and the kind of managed hosted platform version of Cassandra versus... Um, uh, something like Cassandra API, you're still in control of the platform configuration aspects. Uh, there might be more automation in managed instance, but you're still in control. With Cassandra API, uh, Microsoft really controls all of the, the platform level stuff. Gotcha, um, gotcha. Yeah. Did you have a question? No, no, no. It's just, yeah. please go ahead, continue. Yeah, and so what we're adding to managed instance over time is uh, what you know. I like to think of a semi-auto shift. So you know, more uh, more things that you can control. But if we take the anal the analogy further, of course, there's always going to be certain things that we're always doing, right? Otherwise, it's not really a managed service. So deployments, um, OS patching, and and scaling, and so on. Uh, so that th th this what this is really about is trying to give uh, uh, users uh, who like Cassandra uh, as much choice uh, as possible. Um, and and oh, again, it's the same thing. There's always a trade-off. It depends where you, uh, what your starting point is, and so you have this kind of choice. Gotcha. So I wanted to hit migration, and I've got a bunch of <laughs> demos, so we'll see how they go. Um, migration in this context, uh, um, just to be clear, I'm talking about like for like. So where you already have, let's say, a self-hosted uh, version or even a managed version, for that matter. Uh, of some flavor of Cassandra. So you're not migrating from, I don't know, MongoDB or something into Cassandra. You're migrating from a, a, a flavor of Cassandra, but you want to migrate into either managed instance uh, or Cosmos DB with the Cassandra API. Sure. Uh, so if you're like, you're using data stacks and you want to yeah. bring everything over to Azure, that would be kind of a one-to-one -one, uh, just right. using the migration tool. Right, exactly. And even there, there are challenges with migration. Migrations are always a challenge, right? So, and especially live migrations, which is what I'm kind of focusing on here. Um, the nice thing with Cassandra managed instance is what we've done uh, as a managed service, we've, we have kind of had this unique cap capability of allowing people to configure hybrid clusters. Uh, so what that means is if you deploy a managed data center in a managed instance for Apache Cassandra, that data center can join an existing self-hosted um, cluster ring uh, in, in a, a, your own self-hosted version of Cassandra. So what you'll have there is uh, uh, self-hosted on-premise or, or in the cloud, wherever it happens to be, and then a managed data center in the cloud. And just to kind of give a quick, I guess, demo uh, of this, um, it's more of a Blue, P Blue Peter style demo. English people will know what I mean by that. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, here's one I made earlier. Um, this is a um, is a resource resource group in Azure, uh, and I have uh, deployed um, a, an open source Apache Cassandra uh, cluster, and I've got this thing here called Azure Managed Instance for Apache Cassandra, and it's this cluster resource. And what this is in the case of hybrid clusters is kind of like a bookmarking resource, uh, uh, so that the system knows. Uh, that any data centers deployed for a managed instance in this case are going to join an existing clustering of this name. Uh, and so what I have here, uh, if I look in my, uh, where is it? I uh, know, let's go back into the cluster resource. If I go into my data center tab, I can see information about my managed data center here. Um, but there's also a self-hosted data center, which I, if I go into the node tool, um, uh, use the node tool command from one of the nodes on there, uh, I would be able to see both uh, my 
self-hosted data center here and also the managed data center here. So that's that might be something that seems a little bit weird. Why why do we do this? Why are we kind of mixing and matching self-hosting with man with the managed service? And obviously the reason is is quite obvious. Um, for people who want the easiest, most seamless way possible of migrating, let's say from a self-hosted or on-premise Apache Cassandra cluster, there's nothing better and more seamless than actually using Cassandra replication, joining your data center or your, your self-hosted data center with that managed data center. It's a former hybrid and then everything is just seamlessly uh, replicating. And similarly, it doesn't have to be used for migration. It could also be used um, just as a way of extending your capacity. If you're comfortable where you are, whether it's self-hosting or on premises, and you want to use Azure as a kind of on-demand way of scaling up and scaling down elastically, uh, then this is a great way of doing that as well, because we provide automation around deployments, not only, but uh, but also a scaling of uh, up and down of nodes as well within your managed uh, data center. That, so, so that's why we've done that. It sounds like a good uh, disaster recovery option for people yeah. who need to have multiple uh, places that their data needs to leave live or if they're in a scenario where only a certain amount of data can actually exist in Azure based on compliance or regulation, and then they can have the other portion of the data, say, hosted in uh, their own data center. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. It gives you flexibility. Um, but if you're not in the space where you can do that, where uh, you, you know, you're not running a version that's close enough to the versions that we support, or you can't do a hybrid uh, cluster for whatever reason, maybe you're using a you know Cassandra API or some some uh, wire protocol um, uh, version of Cassandra that doesn't support uh, connecting up to our service. Then uh, the the approach that we recommend and we see a lot of people use is this this um, uh, thing called dual rights or double rights as it's sometimes known as. It's not really a new uh, way of doing migrations. So uh, where you have let's say you have uh, data that's being written to the old database over a timeline, let's say, and you start by migrating the schema. What you would do uh, is configure your app to, to write to both the source database and the target database. Typically, when you're writing to target, it would be asynchronous. Um, and then if necessary, uh, you'd also have something that would be migrating or copying the historic data, because obviously you can't guarantee that all the updates are, uh, are going to hit uh, existing data. If your retention is, is short enough, then you, you just leave it running, and then eventually the uh, data in the old system becomes irrelevant. But if it's not, if it's very long, then you want something that migrates all of the old data as well. Either way, you're going to get to a point where you feel that your databases are in sync and then you can validate that, that the migration um, uh, doesn't have any errors and no records missing and then you would cut over at that point. So that would be that pattern. The problem with this pattern is this, this stage, right? <laughs> Configuring your app or changing your app and changing the code uh, to point to different, uh, uh, you know, a different target and uh, everywhere where you're doing uh, um, uh, updates is, uh, you know, maybe a little bit invasive. And if you've got a lot of applications hitting the same database, obviously that's not very convenient. So what we've done is uh, developed a, an open source tool, which we call the dual write proxy. Um, and this is a tool uh, that you can install on an existing Apache Cassandra cluster. So you'd install, it's just a piece of Java software that you install and run um, as a process uh, on each node on a given existing cluster. And when that's running, all you have to do in your application is just change the port. You don't have to do any other changes. And then the proxy will then uh, route both uh, requests to the local node and also uh, the target Cassandra system, whatever that may be, uh, asynchronously. Uh, so this is a way of uh, you know doing the dual rights process, but taking away a lot of the, the pain and concern and the friction and so on. Uh, then, of course, uh, what we recommend for, for doing the, uh, the data copy uh, is using Spark with the Cassandra Spark connector. In this case, you'd have to either backdate or preserve the original write time so that uh, when it's being copied over, um, those records don't overwrite uh, anything that's being updated in, in, uh, live uh, via the proxy and so on. Uh, for this demo that I'm about to do, uh, I, uh, I'm going to use a, a sample uh, that we can share um, uh, that, that preserves the write time, but it also has a, a routine for doing uh, validation and then correcting any errors that come up uh, as well. Um, so yeah, let me, the moment of truth, let's let's uh, do this. So what I have, let me go to my resource group first. In fact, let me go to my app first because there's something I need to, to start running. So what I have here, it's just an app that I'm gonna run uh, 
and all that is uh, doing is just dumping 100,000 records into my source uh, database and table. That's going to simulate, um, uh, you know, data that's already there. Of course, you might have millions of records, but this is a short demo. So I'm just going to dump 100,000 records there. Um, and so while that's that's happening, let me go and look at the resource group that I have. Um, and again, like with the uh, the other hybrid cluster that you saw, I've just, just deployed a vanilla open source Apache Cassandra um, cluster uh, with three nodes. Uh, and then I have a Cosmos DB account in here, uh, a Cassandra API account um, that I'm going to end up uh, migrating to. Um, and I also have a CQLSH uh, tool, which is the tool for interacting with um, Cassandra. So I'm connecting to my source uh, database here. Uh, and then I'm just going to do a count. Hopefully that data has been dumped in there. There we go, 100,000 rows. And much like you saw with Gal demonstrating uh, um, Robo, uh, the Robo mm -hmm. tool, um, I'm using exactly the same tool to connect to Cassandra API. The, the tool works in exactly the same way. All of the drivers, all of the open source tools that you can think of, they work pretty much in the same way. Uh, while the feature compatibility might not be the same, the wire protocol is the same. So all of that that developer experience is still uh, preserved. Uh, so when I run count here, I've got no records. Of, obviously, I'm, I'm about to migrate something. So let me go back to my app here. That's obviously finished now. What this is going to do when I hit enter is it's going to simulate uh, updating uh, some of those records, uh, ver various randomly of those records that, uh, uh, that I inserted, but also adding new records as well. So let me start that running here. And then if I go back to my source table, obviously I should see, let's go back to the source window. Um, I should see the count starting to increase. Obviously there are inserts going in and records being updated. And if I go, what I didn't mention before is that I have a, a, um, installed the proxy already and the app is now pointing uh, to the proxy. So you can see some activity there, it's connected and now it's routing requests or should be routing requests to Cassandra API. Uh, and if I go into my uh, target table, I should see some records starting to appear, which is great. It's I haven't had to do anything except change the port and install the proxy on the source um, uh, Cassandra uh, nodes and then configure it to to point to the target. That's all I've had to do. Um, but of course, uh, you know, I what I that's great that I'm getting the live updates, but I want the historical data in this case. So I also have a Cassandra, uh, sorry, a, a Spark uh, script here that's going to migrate the data. And this is a sample again that we uh, have public that you can use. I've just taken the uh, the cells here and put them into some notebooks here in Azure Databricks. Um, so let me just run this thing here. Sure. Uh, and. And this portion, it's all in browser, which uh, makes it a lot like you don't need to worry about local uh, tools to be installed. It's it's all here for you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's some code. You have to uh, use uh, um, uh, Spark and, and the Spark Connector and uh, the libraries that, that we put together. Um, but yeah, it's pretty it's pretty straightforward, I think, uh, to interact with, hopefully. Um, so this is running a, so this is going to migrate all of those hundred thousand uh, records, and uh, who knows how long this is going to take. <laughs> sometimes it's quick, sometimes it's slow. So if you have any, maybe this is a good time to ask another question or sure. Uh, so, Gal, one of the big differences between what you were showing, as far as Mongo is concerned, and what Theo is showing, is the lack of schema that's required in order to actually work with your data. And, and if I'm right, uh, whenever we need to make some modifications to our application, we may need a new key and value to get stored. We don't have to go ahead and migrate our data to a new version with a new schema. Am I right about that? Um, from a longer perspective, uh, on a, um, yeah, you, you can basically create whichever documents uh, you want, whichever keys you want. The only important thing to mention there is if you are created, creating a sharded collection, that uh, shard key needs to stay consistent and needs mm -hmm. to be in every single document you insert into that collection. Because, and the reason for that is because it needs the database needs to know how to split up um, the documents on each shard individually. And it needs Great. to know where to go, basically. Great. 
So Theo, it looks like your yeah. your process finished. Right. Yeah, it finished. And uh, while you're talking there, I also ran this validation routine. And um, you might think that I'll be alarmed by this, but I'll, I'll break the suspense. I, I deliberately engineered this, <laughs> this failure. So there's, uh, there's the 1,582 records that failed. So it looks like there are some missing rows in here. I can see um, uh, the reasons for failure, missing rows, or some updates didn't get make it through. And again, I'll break the suspense. I'll tell you why this failed. What happened is that um, when I uh, did the data copy, um, mm -hmm. I was saturating the throughput on Cosmos DB. And so when the client uh, was be was um, trying to do the requests, it was it was working fine to the source um, database, but I'm getting this uh, request rate is large. And this is by far uh, the, the sort of most likely thing that you'll run into if you're trying to do a migration to any API in Cosmos DB for the first time, and you're used to using something that's provisioned in a more traditional way. A Cosmos DB is a, a, a request-based currency. So it works on this thing called request units. You have to provision enough for what you need. And if you exceed that amount, you get what we call rate limited. That's something that we could probably uh, spend a, a whole other show uh, talking about. Uh, but in this case, I, uh, I was a little stupid deliberately. I, I ran uh, my data copy at the same time as my steady state workload was at its peak. So obviously I should expect to get uh, throttled and, and not have enough um, performance there. One of the ways or a couple of the ways that you could avoid this is one, you could go into the Cassandra API account or any account, I, I believe now, I think we have to support this everywhere, certainly Cassandra and Mongo, uh, go into features and you can enable something called uh, server-side retry. And what that will do is uh, during rate limiting, it will actually retry on the server uh, up to a certain limit of 60 seconds. And after that, it will time out. Another thing you can do is um, uh, in the actual uh, Spark settings, obviously you can limit the throughput uh, that's mm -hmm. getting stuck through during that period of time. So you could fix it that way. Um, and uh, so that's all, all well and good, but uh, I've still got a problem. I've, I've lost uh, some records. So how do I correct that? Well, there is a, we have also have a, a script here uh, that just allows you uh, to retry those transient failures by just filtering on them, filtering on the failed rows, running the uh, the, uh, the migration, sorry, the validation routine again, and then uh, running the migration routine to get the, the records that failed and, and just sending them again. So let me just try uh, doing that. And hopefully that's not going to take as long as the other things that I've just run. Great. And just to give you a, a, a heads up on time, we got about maybe five minutes or so. Yeah. Uh, before we got to wrap up. Yeah, we're, we're good. I think we're going to be good. We're making good time. It's always fun when you do it live and you have to like, yeah. kind of like, hey, how many it's, minutes yeah. left? Kinda Especially with a ridiculously ambitious demo like like this. <laughs> I ventured in a failure on a non-deterministic uh, kind of uh, well, process. I, Never mind. I think you're doing a great job. Yeah. So it looks like we're, gonna, we're about to get a result here. Um, so again, this is this is retried uh, all of those failed records, and hopefully this will finish pretty soon. Maybe I want. So yeah. Sure, I was just going to ask Al while we were waiting. Uh, is there any real limitation on how much storage I can use for the the amount of data that I'm going to be uh, putting into Cosmos? Uh, the storage, yeah. So there, there is no uh, limit to the storage uh, that you can use as long as your uh, your cluster is sharded. You can scale as much as you want. There is, um, I think, there is a um, uh, a minimum number of throughput for the storage, but that can be obviously li lifted somewhat um, depending on your use case. Uh, but overall, as long as your da your database or collection is sharded, you can, you can scale as much as you want. There's no limit there. It's unlimited. That, that's great because one yeah. of the more difficult parts about database management is managing the underlying storage and actually being concerned yeah. like how much is there how much is getting backed up is it all getting packed up so knowing that this is all done through a pass that you don't have to concern yourself with those things is great uh so theo how how'd everything work out yeah awesome so what happened then while you were talking is uh i uh, ran the um retry failures uh, script here and then i ran the validation uh, to see if i was okay and it looks like i've got no failures so i guess the one final check i can do is just do run the count on my source um and then run the count on my target and hopefully it's a similar number or the same number great awesome so yeah that's exactly the same so that would that was it really um 
for the <laughs> uh, for the for the migration. Um, and that was yeah a live uh, live migration using um, completely open source tools, the Cassandra uh, migrator sample for for the Spark connector to preserve write time and also um, the dual write proxy. Um, and in this case, I did it for Cassandra API for the first time. So uh, if you want to know how to live migrate Cassandra API, uh, this is how to do it. We've got this documented as well. Um, um, if you want to repeat this process and uh, um, yeah, reach out if there are. Yep. And the, the Cosmos DB documentation I've got up here, and I'm going to take your screen out now, uh, Theo. Uh, the documentation is up here uh, at cda.ms. 3J3, where you can go and you can get all the information on Cosmos DB, uh, including all the documentation. There are some tutorials, some code samples, uh, a reference guide, um, links to, say, the different API SDKs that you may need for the different types of APIs that there are. Uh, and we only touched on two really today. Uh, Cassandra and Mongo, we talked a little about there's the SQL one. There's also uh, Gremlin for uh, graph databasing. And then, of course, table for just pretty simple storage of, like, say, keys and values. Um, so th those are the big ideas. And we're, we're just about out of time. Um, and so I just wanted to start by saying I'm going to bring up this little bit of uh, background just so we can close with some nice music in the back so um first gal can you tell people how if they'd like to reach you uh and talk about anything on the internet where they can yeah uh, feel free to reach out to me on linkedin uh that website goes straight to my linkedin so feel free to send me a message always happy to answer questions and uh the docs page for the api for mongodb uh, microsoft docs is a great way to get started Great. And, and Theo, same same question. Where can people get in touch with you to learn more about Cosmos DB or uh, reach out with questions? Yeah, you can, you, you, uh, can reach out to me on Twitter, but um, I almost never use it. So technically, you can reach out to me. My handle's there, but reach out to me on LinkedIn as well. Uh, it's easy to find me. I think I'm pretty much the only Theo Van Fry in the world, it looks like. So you put me into Google and I just I seem to pop up straight away. Well, very cool. So, gentlemen, I want to say thank you so much for being part of the show today. Um, for those of you watching, if you go into the show notes, you'll be able to get a full list of links of different documentation that you can check out. Um, and any uh, there's also a link to the free tier uh, info on um, Cosmos DB. So if you want to get started, you don't want to spend a few bucks on it. You just want to see where it takes you. Maybe you want to just create a couple documents and see how you can access them or modify them. Give the free tier a try. Anyway, gentlemen, um, thanks so much for being part of this today. I know it's uh, it's in the evening out there, Theo and Gal, we've got, you know, a little bit of our day left. Um, I hope you stay warm. It is absolutely terrifyingly cold here. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Thanks, no Jay. Guys, let's give everybody the big wave goodbye. And uh, I will catch you all next time here on Azure Fun Bites. Uh, thanks for watching. See you soon.